Um, everybody, this is something that I, I really didn't want to bring up, but we got to bring up. We got to talk about it. And we're going to talk about it in this service, and we're going to talk about it in the 11 o'clock service, and that's the state of the United Methodist Church. It will be a serious conversation. I know it will be a serious conversation. You're like, Nate, don't be a Debbie Downer. I'm sorry. Uh, part of my role as the pastor is to inform you and keep you informed. And so on next Sunday, July 26th, in this service and in the 11 o'clock service, we're going to have what we're calling the state of the UMC. And we'll just be talking about the United Methodist Church and, and where we're at. First, what I want y'all to know, and I'm going to remind you next Sunday too, take a deep breath, all right? Take one with me. <sighs> we will be okay, all right? God is in this. God's working through this, all right? And we haven't made a decision yet. So for all those people who are making rumors and gossip saying, well, friendship has done this, friendship has done that, we haven't done anything yet, okay? No decision's been made. So just take a deep breath, relax, calm down. And I'm telling myself that too. Uh, next Sunday, we'll be talking about it and we'll go through that. So much going on in our lives right now, right? I know you're as busy as I am. Today's Father's Day. We're thankful for all those fathers that are here in this church and in our lives that have always been working in our lives. We know that chaos surrounds us, and we're going to be talking about that in the sermon. But even in chaos, God is still present. Even when the world is going to hell in a handbasket, God is present. And so that's something we've got to hold on to as believers. Instead of giving up, instead of saying, I can't take this anymore, instead of throwing up our hands, we've got to say God's still present. So will you pray with me now as we know God is present? Heavenly Father, we are here in this place. We come worshiping you first and foremost. It'd be easy to run off into the wilderness and and be by ourselves, Lord, but that's not what you called us to do. You called us to be together, to worship. So as we're in this place, worshiping you, God, remind us, let us hear your still, small voice, Lord, that no matter how bad everything seems to be, you are still working, you are still alive, that you don't leave us or forsake us. Lord, some of us are tired and weary. And we've had long days and nights. And we look towards the next morning with dread, Lord. Help us. But Lord, for those of us who are energized, who are excited, who are, who are ready to serve you as you have called us to, Lord, enable us, equip us, and show us that direction that you have called us to go. Lord, don't ever let us get so busy that we can't hear you. Don't let us ever get so busy, so scared, so surrounded that we can't hear you. Your voice is what we want to hear this morning. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Reminder, we don't pass the basket. The basket's located back there. But even better, you just pull your phone out. It's okay. Open up the app and you can give through there. Continue our worship with good, good Father. You may remain seated or stand.
before I spoke a word, he was singing for us. I think I could have sang that for another verse. How about y'all? Yeah, that was a great song. Great job. 
You all, if you will stand for the reading of God's holy word, it comes from Kings chapter, 1 Kings chapter 19, 1 through 15. It's a little long, but it's okay. Uh, 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 1 through 15. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with a sword. Then Jezebel sent a message or to Elijah saying, so may the gods do to me and all more also if I do not make your life like the life of the one of them by this time tomorrow. Then he was afraid. He got up and fled for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah. He left his servant there, but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a solitary broom tree. He asked that he might die. It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under under the broom tree and fell asleep. Suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, get up and eat. He looked and there at his head was a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord came a second time, touched him, and said, Get up and eat, otherwise the journey will be too much for you. He got up, ate and drank, ate and drank. Then he went in with the strength and food for forty days and forty nights to Horb, the mount of God. At that place he came to a cave and spent the night there. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord and God, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. He said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind, so strong that there was a splitting mountains and breaking rocks and pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind and the earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in the mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Then there came a voice to him that said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, for the God of hosts. For the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed the prophets and the sword. I am left, I alone am left. And they are seeking my life to take it away. Then the Lord said, go return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. (laughs) It's Father's Day, y'all. It's Father's Day. There's so many jokes to make about Father's Day and how much it doesn't get recognized and so uh, what I'm going to do now is just give it a little bit of love because I am a father in, in this piece of scripture because I could not help but hear my dad's voice. My dad was a loud Italian, all right? So for many of y'all, y'all could hear it, but there was never a quiet for my dad. And us as boys, we all inherited it. If you're around my family, if you're around the boys when they get together, there's how many brothers? I have two brothers and a sister. My youngest sister is actually like, 20 years younger than I am. Thank you, Erica, for helping me because I can't keep it all in my head. She's nodding. Yes, you're right. It's okay. All right. So, and so when all of us get together, it's really loud, but I can't help but hear my dad when, when I hear this, what are you doing here? What are you doing here, Elijah? But he would say it a little more, not as fun as my voice sounds. What are you doing here? Right? Have you ever done that as a dad? Have you ever been a father? If you're a father, have you ever been to that point where everything's quiet in the house and you know that your children are up to something, right? And you walk into the room and you see all the toilet paper spread out through all the places and every crack and crevice and there's not a roll left anymore. And so what do you say? What are you doing here? Okay, none of y'all do that. All right, I'm the only one. It's just me. It's okay. I'm harnessing my inner Chris Farley. What are you doing here? Right? No, still not working. All right. So here we have God. Here we have Elijah. Elijah, 
Guys, if you have not read about Elijah, he is one of the great heroes of the Bible. Read about him. There's so much in here. And then there's this also this lady. We open up the, the story with this lady named Jezebel. Now, quick story, and Maria helped me out with this a little bit, right? Jezebel, how beautiful of a name is Jezebel, right? Wouldn't you want to name your daughter Jezebel? No, why not? Because of the Bible, right? Because exactly what the Bible says. There's this lady named Jezebel, and after Elijah, and like Maria told me, Elijah did all sorts of things, called down lightning, slain, all sorts of things. He was a powerful prophet, but this one lady named Jezebel scared him to death. One lady. He faced everything else in the world, but this one woman came after him, and it sent him into the wilderness. In the preceding chapters of 1 Kings 17 and 18, Elijah is the prophet in charge. Everything seems to be going his way, confronting kings and the followers of Baal, performing miracles, including raising the dead from their graves. He even calls lightning down from heaven. Have any of y'all ever done that? Ever called lightning down from heaven? Tried a couple of times, it didn't work. But now, in 1 Kings 19, we find that Elijah is intimidated by his opponents and filled with self-doubt, complaining that things are not going his way. He even wants his life to end, if you read it in the Scripture. And if you start to read this, piece of cha- this chapter, this piece of Scripture, it might be a great metaphor for a tough journey, right? If we want to soften it, if we want to make it easy, we can say, well, this is just a difficult journey. Well, how many of you have ever been on a difficult journey? Right, go ahead and raise your hand. Almost all of us have been on a, on a difficult journey. Have, have, you, have your lives been so easy that you've never had to face a difficult time at all? Have you ever been to the point that Elijah has that you just wanted to run to the wilderness and sleep under a tree? Has it ever been that bad? Have you ever been to a time in your life when you've done all that you can do, the best that you can, as good as you can, but everything is still falling around, falling down around you? Nothing you do pleases anybody. And you've been to the point of giving up. Have you ever been there? Don't raise your hand there. I don't. I would love to tell you today that being a Christian is easy. I would love to tell you that once you gave your life up to Jesus Christ, that it was everything about unicorns, rainbows, chocolate chip cookies, double stuffed Oreos, and a big glass of milk. I'd love to tell you that that's the way it is. But I cannot tell you that. Others that tell you that are failing you. They're selling you a false theology. And there's many in this world, many pastors who've made millions of dollars of throwing, selling a prof, uh, theology that is all on profit and good things. Here's the truth, that if I didn't tell you about this, then I'm not a pastor. If I'm not telling you about the to- difficult times that you're going to face in life, then I'm not preparing you for what you're going to be called to do for the world that you're going to be called out into. We are not promised a life of ease and daisies. We're not promised that. But what we are promised is that God will always be with you. God will always be with you. Did you hear that? That you will never be alone. Did you hear that? That you will never be alone. And we'll get to that alone part. A little bit. That God is with you in the worst of times and in the best of times. And there will be good times. Don't take out of this sermon that there's no good times in being a Christian. There are great times. Being here at worship with y'all is so much fun. I love it. But in the worst of times, God is with you. So what we're going to do this morning is we're going to look at one of the greatest prophets at one of his lowest points. A man that called down lightning did everything that God called him to do. 
all the good that he could do at his lowest points. And let's start with verse 4. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a solitary broom tree. He asked that he might die. It is enough now, O Lord, take my life, for I'm no better than my ancestors. Could you hear the pain in that piece of scripture? Could you hear the feeling and emotion in that piece of scripture? That at that moment, Elijah just wanted to go, lay under a tree, and die? What takes you to that place? What pushes somebody to that point? Those are points that we'll all face in our lives. Those are points that nobody is alone in facing. So as a side, though, when you look at this piece of Scripture, and we'll get into it, how, how long did Elijah go into the wilderness? Did, did any of y'all read? 40 days. Who else went into the wilderness? Pop quiz. Jesus, for how many days? Hmm, interesting, right? Guys, there's danger in going into the wilderness. There's danger in doing what Elijah did. This is not a good place for you to go. This is why God takes the time and says, what are you doing here, Elijah? He knows why and how dangerous it is for him to be there and, and why Elijah is there. There's danger in going into the wilderness. And when you're in the wilderness, you're vulnerable. I, all of y'all, I, I bragged, and I probably shouldn't do it in church. I like that show, Naked and Afraid, okay? But there's this new show out there, okay? There's this new show out there. It's called Alone. Have you ever seen Alone? Alone is creepier, all right? You're, you go, they drop you off in some of the coldest environments, and you have to outlast the other person. The clicker is, the, the thing that, the, the biggest thing about it is, you don't know how long the other person will stay out there. You have no idea that they're still out there. You only get what you bring, and you have to catch and do all these other things. And they always start the show with, you're alone in the most dangerous environment, filled with bears, wolverines, and everything that can eat you. You are no longer on the top of the food chain. That's the wilderness, guys. That's the wilderness. That is the exact description of the wilderness. And that's the same place that many of us want to go out to when, when everything gets the worst. Where we think we can be alone, we try to go out into the wilderness, and the wilderness is dangerous. We should never go out into the wilderness, especially alone. We've seen it more today than any other time. People are isolating themselves. They're going out alone into the wilderness. They're facing all that they're facing by themselves. You'll see it. Mental health is at, at its worst peak right now. People are suffering. Why? Because they want to be alone. There's danger in being alone out in the wilderness. We were not created to be isolated. Weren't created to be isolated. Think about it from the very beginning. Who, were the, who was the first person ever made? Guys, it's Sunday. You should remember this story. Adam, right? So Adam's there, he's the first person, he's just chilling out, and then God says what? It's not good for Adam to be alone, right? It's not good for Adam to be alone. And at that time, where was Adam living? We'd say the, the uh, Garden of Eden, where he was naming all the birds and the animals and stuff like that. Sounds a lot like the wilderness to me. If it wasn't good for Adam to be alone, the first man... The man walking beside God to be alone. What makes it think that you are okay to be alone in the wilderness? So God says what? It's not good for Adam to be alone, and he creates who? That's right. Good job, y'all. Finally, that coffee's kicking in. 
We were never meant to be alone. There's danger in being alone. That's why on Sundays, what are we called to do? Are we called to sit at home by ourselves and watch the TV? It's not good for us. I'm proud of all of you who are watching online with us, but we'd much rather you be here. Why? Because here you're not what? Alone. You're not alone when you're here. When you're here, what is supposed to happen? You're supposed to build relationships, get to know each other, connect, right? That whole connect, grow, serve thing. I hope that some of you have friends in this worship service. If you don't, I'll be your friend. Because I don't want you to be alone. I don't want anyone to be alone. Because alone is what? Dangerous. Alone is dangerous. And this is where Elijah goes. Out into the wilderness to be alone. Verse 5 through 7 says, Then he lay down. Here's the, Oh man, I love this part. Then he lay down under the broom tree and fell asleep. Suddenly an angel touched him and he said to him, get up and eat. He looked and there at his head was a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord came a second time, touched him and said, get up and eat. Otherwise the journey will be too much for you. Is this not an amazing, awesome visual? You fall asleep under a tree. You're, you're as depressed as you can be, so much so that you want to die. And then something touches you. And it's not a, wake up! It's not anything like that. It's a, hey, Elijah, wake up. Get up, Elijah. And when he wakes up, what does he see? A cake. Who doesn't get happy at cake, right? And did any of y'all get excited when you saw a little bit of cake over there? I did. This guy likes cake. But not just any cake. Miss Jean and makes amazing cakes. Miss Dell makes amazing cakes. We have a lot of cake makers. Christian made that cake. His wife, I'm sorry, gave the wrong credit. <laughs> gave it back to the wife. But can you imagine a cake baked by an angel? What that must have tasted like? Here's the dad joke, all right? You think, oh, there it is. You stole it from me, Mary, Mary Beth. You shouldn't have done that. I had one dad joke, and that was it. But can you imagine what it must have tasted like? God provides for us when we're in the wilderness. God doesn't want us to be in the wilderness. Even in our worst of days, God provides for us to get out. Did you see why that cake was baked there? Why it was left there? What did he say? So that you have the strength to do what? To go. So you have the strength to go. But it's up to us to eat that cake, isn't it? It's up to us to eat that cake. Well, we see it there. It's up to us. When we're, in that, when we're in the wilderness, when we're all alone, and God gives us something, says, here's the power, here you can go. You've got to make that choice. You have to make that decision to accept the help of God. Here's the kicker, though. This is what we need to pay close attention to. What separated Adam and Eve from God? Do you all remember pop quiz? We're talking a lot about Adam and Eve, right? What separated Adam and Eve from God? Sin. Sin separated us from Adam and Eve. Usually sin is what leads us into the wilderness all by ourselves. What separates us from God is sin. So to accept the help from God, we have to turn away from that sin that is separating us from him, right? Yes. If you're off in the wilderness and you've got a whole bunch of sin in your life, the best way out is to get rid of that sin, to get closer to God. You see, God does not want you in the wilderness. God doesn't want you there. God wants you somewhere else. That's why when we hear this piece of scripture, what are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing here? Verse 10 says, he answered, I've been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. 
I, am, I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. Poor Elijah. <laughs> this is, okay, this is where my dad would say, stop having a pity party. Does your parents, dad, ever use that one? Don't have a pity party. It sounds like that, doesn't it? There will be times in your life that no matter how much good you do, it feels like there is no good around you. Evil is all around us. Guys, this is what we hold on to. This is what we know, that this truth, that we are in a spiritual war between good and evil, right? Good and evil's out there. And evil hates good and will do anything for a victory. Evil will cheat. Now, I told you I had, how many brothers do y'all remember? Oh, that's not a pop quiz you have to worry about. I had two, Alex and Brian. Now, Alex was three years younger than me. Brian, I can't remember how many years. He's the middle kid. Erica knows, 10 years younger than me. Now, there was very often times where me and my brothers, we would get into fights. We would be wrestling, right? But when you get into a fight with your brother, there's no rules, none at all especially when you're the older one because you don't want to get beat by the younger one, you will do anything that you can to win that fight. You will punch, hit, bite, scream, pull, pinch, anything to win. Guess what, guys? That's exactly what evil's doing right now. Evil will do anything to win over good right now. There's nothing against it. And we're in that fight. Let's go on, verse 11 to 13. It says, he said, go out and stand on the mountain. So here's Elijah. He hears the words and he said, from the angel. that He said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind. Pay close attention to this. He goes to a mountaintop, and all of a sudden there's a great wind so strong that it was splitting the mountains and breaking the rocks in, in pieces before the Lord. Would any of you get nervous about being up there if all of a sudden a great wind hit? I've been on very few mountaintops. Stone Mountain is one of the very few mountains that I've been on top of. Yeah, I'm not that explorative. All right, I'm not sure that's a word. But when a wind blows on a mountain, you feel it, don't you? There's no way you can't feel it. Can you imagine how Elijah must have said, you called me up from the wilderness onto this mountaintop, and now all of a sudden you're going to have this big wind up here? And then what happens? So strong that the, it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks into pieces before the Lord. Could you get any more nervous? But that's not all. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. Metter just had an earthquake. All these Georgians are freaking out because they experienced a 3.0 earthquake. I got cousins in California that would laugh at them. All of a sudden, there's an earthquake. Not enough that you're on a mountaintop. The wind's blowing pretty high. You're seeing the rocks being split. Then an earthquake happens. Guys, can we get any worse? First, you say a strong wind splitting rocks and an earthquake. What happens next? Do you all read this scripture? Fire, right? Can you imagine what Elijah must have been thinking in his head? What must have been going through his mind? He said, Lord, I was fine down by this tree all by myself in the wilderness. You called me to this mountaintop. All of a sudden, there's wind going. There's splitting rocks. There's an earthquake. And then what happens but fire? But the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake, and after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. After the fire, a sound of sheer silence. If you live through the hurricane here, or if you've ever been in any kind of storm, you know that silence can be scary, can't it? That sometimes silence is the worst because you know something's about to happen. But this is what happens next. When Elijah heard it, what did he hear? When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and he went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. 
Then there, there came a voice to him that said, What are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing here, Elijah? I like the King James Version of this. It said, and he said, go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord, and behold, the Lord passed by, and a, uh, behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rip, ripped the mountains and break the piece of the rocks before the Lord, and the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not at the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And this is the piece of scripture. scripture. This is the translation. Of that. And after the fire, a still small voice. And so it was, when Elijah heard it, that he wrapped his face in the mantle, and he went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What dost thou hear, Elijah? What are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing here, Elijah? You guys, if we stop focusing on all the bad that's going on around us, the wind, the rain, the hurricanes, the fires, the tornadoes, the, uh, everything that's calamity that's around us, maybe we might be able to hear that still small voice. If we stop focusing on the wilderness that surrounds us, maybe we might just hear that still small voice that calls out to you, what are you doing here? God didn't want him there. God wanted him somewhere else. Doing the work that he's been called to do. So what happens after Elijah leaves this wilderness and, and continues to do the ministry? What, what is the most amazing part of Elijah's story? Did any of you know? Did Elijah face the death of a normal person? No. No. After bestowing his mantle on a successor, who was his successor? Pop quiz. None of y'all know. It's okay. Elisha. It's often confused. Elijah, Elisha, right? Elisha. The prophet Elijah was taken up to heaven in a whirlwind. Man, can you imagine that? He went from being in the wilderness, wanting to die, to this place of glory unlike any other. This morning, there are some of you that are in the wilderness. There are some people that you know that are in the wilderness. You may be that still small voice that they need to hear right now. They don't need to be alone, and neither do you. You need to be that voice for them today. So that maybe they can hear God. So that they can realize they don't need to be in that wilderness alone. That the wilderness is dangerous. That's your challenge this morning. If you're in the wilderness and you need help out, talk to somebody. I'm here. I'll help you. Come to me say, Nate, I'm in the wilderness. I won't even ask you what your wilderness looks like. It could be anything. I'll try to get you out. We'll call God. I love that song that we sang before, that reckless love. There's no place that God won't find you. What are you doing here? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have not left us in the wilderness, that it's not your desire to, for us to be here. Instead, Lord, you don't want us to be alone. You want us to be with you. So bring us close to you. Let us know you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together and sing one of my favorites for sure. Here I am to worship. spent
All right, take a moment, look around. I want you to say to that person next to you, you're not alone. Do it. I can't hear you guys. You're not alone. Look at the person around you. Tell them, you're not alone. I think you finally heard it. You're not alone. We don't want you to be alone. We want you to be with us. We want you to be with God. But I'm about to send you out of this place and into the wilderness with wolverines and polar bears and everything that wants to eat you. (laughs) But you're always welcome to come back. So hear this benediction, go from this place now, filled with the love, the peace, the joy that only God can give you, knowing that you're not alone. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, we'll see you next Sunday. Amen. What's up?